Well, good afternoon, all. We're glad you could join us for this Pool Safely Grants webinar. I have with me Harvey Kincaid and Barbara Little, and I'm Jonathan Midget. If you have any questions uh, throughout this uh, webinar of a technical nature, you can send me an email at jmidget, M I D G E T T, at cpsc.gov, or to consumerombudsman at cpsc.gov, and we'll try to help you out. Um, also, I want to highlight the fact that Closed captioning is available uh, in the bottom left-hand side of your screen, the CC icon will bring up closed captioning. And um, we are recording this session uh, for future questions. Um, and at the end, we'll be able to take some more questions, uh, but uh, we'll be recording questions as well too, just so everybody knows. So, uh, any other things that I forget anything? Harvey, you are up and the floors yours. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Harvey Kincaid. Uh, I'm a grants management uh, specialist here at uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, and I am here to talk to you about the Pool Safely Grant Program, or uh, PSGP. And the Pool Safely Grant Program was authorized by the Virginia Graham Baker Act. Uh, there have been a few changes uh, this year. And uh, we're, we'll be talking about those as we uh, as we discuss them. But if it's uh, uh, if it's a program you've looked at before, um, please uh, stay tuned, and uh, we'll talk about those changes. Uh, you may find the announcement on um, grants.gov, and it's uh, CPSC 23-001. Let's see where we are. There we go. Is that sharing now? Yeah, it looks like it is. Yeah. Dan, well, can you give me a thumbs up that we are sharing our screen? Yes, good. Okay, good. Thank okay. you. Excellent. Uh, so uh, here first, let's talk about some of the objectives. Um, uh, here uh, to start, I wanna just provide an overview and um, Prior to discussing the purpose, I do want to address eligibility. Uh, there are a couple of um, different eligibility requirements, and uh, um, those need to be addressed first. Um, so you can decide if, if if this is if you qualify for this grant program, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the purpose. Uh, we'll go into the application and the review process. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the post award information, meaning the notice of award and some of the some of the general expectations um, that uh, that will be required if, if you apply and do receive a grant award. And then finally, I'll, I'll provide um, my name and my email address uh, there at the end. Uh, if you have any questions or want to follow up on something, uh, you'll be able to contact myself. Uh, in addition, uh, you'll be able to contact Janet Davis, who I believe is joining us online. Uh, she is my uh, uh, grants management official that we work with closely. Uh, so uh, there'll be an opportunity to contact us. I do believe we'll, we'll also put this uh, PowerPoint um, presentation uh, up on the uh, agency's uh, website as well. Okay. See. Oh, yeah, there we go. One more. There we are. Okay, uh, here to talk about uh, the overview. Uh, again, the Pool Safely Grant Program is uh, authorized by the Virginia Graham Baker Act. Um, the, the law has been in effect for a number of years and it was reauthorized uh, just this year. Um, it was uh, the last time I was checking, I did not see it uh, online yet, but the uh, reauthorization can be found uh, there at the second bullet, Public Law 117328. It's probably fairly big, but the uh, Division BB Title IV uh, will get you to the CPSC and the Virginia Graham Baker Act portion uh, uh, of the public law. Um, it's codified at 15 USC uh, 8004. Again, um, at some point, um, the the websites uh, that provide citations will will catch up, and you'll be able to see um, the reauthorization language in there. But uh, um, but you can take a look there, and and much of what we we discuss we will discuss here as far as 
um, legal eligibility and uh, applicant eligibility uh, can be found there. Uh, there is a total of 3.5 million dollars available. Uh, that includes um, some prior funding as well as some new funding. Um, applicants may request a, a grant of up to four hundred thousand um, dollars. As I indicate elsewhere uh, in this slide deck, um, the minimum would be about would be fifty thousand dollars, but again, up to four hundred thousand uh, dollars. Given the nature of the funding. Uh, that we received from Congress for this purpose. Uh, we are making awards with a 2 year project period or a 2 year budget period. Uh, so, uh, it is many federal grants run on a annual with a single year, but because of the nature of this funding, uh, there is a, a 2 year project period uh, associated with this uh, with this grant effort. And then the last bullet here is is something that was. Uh, included in, in the congressional notes, and I did want to highlight it here that some aspects of the grant proposal may be achieved by contracting with other entities, including civic organizations. Um, you can think of um, uh, things like uh, swimming lessons through YMCA or some other uh, nonprofit provider. Um, Congress did note that. Uh, Note uh, this relationship with some emphasis, so I wanted to pass it on to you all. Um, a subcontract relationship is probably the best uh, situation. It's a slightly different relationship than um, a sub recipient, um, which uh, is a higher level of involvement. Um, so ideally, uh, uh, if you if you do choose to uh, work with other other civic or nonprofit organizations. It would be on a, a contract or a subcontract basis. Uh, the uh, federal government provides uh, what's known as the assistance listings. Now, it's always been the CFDA, the catalog of federal domestic assistance. Uh, I still refer to it as the CFDA. Uh, but if you go there, all different uh, federal grant programs are outlined there and. The pool safely grant program can be found at 87 dash, uh, excuse me, 87 dot 002. Uh, anytime there's a new grant program, they have to get uh, listed in this. Uh, uh, catalog or listing and uh, it helps uh, inform the public about uh, about what different grant programs are out there. So if you do receive an award, you may see something 87.002, and that is the uh, that is the reference again to the catalog of federal domestic assistance. If you go into grants.gov, you'll be able to find uh, the FOA number there again, CPSC-23-001. Uh, and finally, here we uh, have the deadline, and it's also there in grants.gov that they must be submitted, and this is a hard deadline. Uh, by April 30th of 2023, um, there are possibilities if there's a natural disaster or something or, or, or grants.gov goes down, uh, there may be uh, an additional window, but generally speaking, uh, that is a hard deadline. So if you're interested in applying, please note that deadline. And uh, let's see, we're at African eligibility. Uh, yes, uh, the the first uh, spot where I want to discuss eligibility is with the uh, applicant eligibility, and there is some new language here. Uh, eligible entities are governmental, state, local governments have traditionally been um, uh, eligible to apply, uh, but uh, in the reauthorization, uh, Congress uh, permitted that Indian tribes are now eligible to apply. Um, the uh, if you if you are applying and you are an Indian tribe, uh, you'll need to uh, probably provide some background. Not all Indian tribes are eligible. I did take a look at the uh, reauthorization law, and uh, there they uh, relate to twenty five USC fifty three oh four. I know that's uh, that's a, a lot as far as a reference, but that's where the definition of of uh, eligible tribes may be found. Uh, again, that reference is twenty five USC fifty three oh four. Indian tribe 
uh, means any Indian tribe, band, or nation, or other organized group or community, including any Alaska Native village or regional village corporation as defined in or established pursuant to the Alaska New Claims Settlement Act, uh, which is recognized as eligible for the special programs and services uh, provided by the United States uh, to Indians because of their status as Indians. Uh, I read that out in part because my understanding from speaking to legal counsel is that the the shorthand of um, um, federally recognized tribes um, is not complete, that there could be other openings there. So uh, again, if you are a tribal uh, organization and you'd like to apply, or if you have more questions, please let us know. Um, but there's a distinct definition there that was provided in the reauthorization. Um, but again, it is new this year that Indian tribes are eligible to apply. So here we have the, uh, the first prong when it comes to eligibility, and that is applicant eligibility, state, local, state or local government or an Indian tribe. Uh, the second um, uh, eligibility prong I'm just referring to is legal eligibility, and you can see that under the second bullet here. Um, and that is that you have to enact um, VGBA compliant laws, and we'll discuss that next. Uh, the requirement, um, which remains uh, the 15 USC 8005 is still a good citation. Uh, it was brought over in the reauthorization as well. Uh, as we'll see later, we are asking uh, that you support your application through an attachment that indicates uh, that you are legally eligible, um, meaning that you have compliant laws. Uh, you will need to submit um, those as part of the attachment. Um, the second bullet there, the, or the, excuse me, the third main bullet there um, is that, and we address this in our FAQs, the International Swimming Pool and Spa Code likely meets these requirements, but we are still asking uh, that you provide documentation uh, that those laws are on the books and that you are enforcing them. Okay, more specifically, uh, that legal requirement uh, involves a couple of different items, but primarily it involves uh, looking at that first uh, first sub point uh, barriers or um, uh, enclosures, ways to um, bar entry to the pool. That's the first prong. And then the second one uh, deals with the number of drains. And this is, again, VGB8, uh, Virginia Graham Baker Act specific. Um, the the nature of the problem that Congress was seeking to solve here are uh, was non-compliant drains that 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 caused um, uh, bodily harm, and here we're talking about under that second bullet sub bullet uh, the number of drains, a blockable drains, or no main drain. I am no expert here in this this regard, but uh, I have reviewed the CPSC uh, YouTube series on this where it's addressed in great detail. Uh, we will review uh, your application and your attachment for legal sufficiency. So you need to be the right kind of applicant. And then as well, you need to have the uh, VGBA compliant laws uh, on the books there. And as I discovered uh, this last round of funding, uh, sometimes those laws are passed by the state and it is left up to local jur jurisdictions on whether to enforce those. Um, that would need to be passed by your local jurisdiction as well and enforced at that level. Um, it's not sufficient that they're just passed at the state level if you are uh, a local applicant. They need to be enforced at that, at that lowest level of jurisdiction, either the county level, the, the, the city level. Um, but uh, that is, again, a hard eligibility requirement. It's in the law, and we ask that you, uh, again, provide an attachment to your application, which we'll discuss in a minute, uh, to document that. Okay, and this is another change with the reauthorization that uh, I want to highlight. Um, under the, 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 the prior law, it was a 50-50 split between what we call enforcement funds and what we call education funds. With the reauthorization, that ratio has changed. And now uh, under the reauthorization, 
25% of the funds uh, must be spent on uh, enforcement and uh, up to 75 can be spent on, on education. And we'll look at education here in a minute. But the 25% uh, used for enforcement, we're looking again here at the slide to hire and train personnel for the implementation of enforcement standards under your local law, which will be uh, VGBA compliant and to defray administrative uh, costs that may be associated with hiring or, or training your existing uh, personnel. Uh, during this last round, we did get an application and they listed, uh, for instance, um, lifeguards as providing enforcement. And that's generally not what we're talking about here. This is code enforcement. Uh, it may be housed in different local, uh, different portions of your local government. Uh, it may be uh, on the, the code side, it may be uh, recreation, parks and recreation, but um, but again, we're talking about enforcing uh, the VGBA compliant laws uh, as far as enforcement is concerned. And here's the uh, other um, part of funding that, that I just mentioned, up to 75%. Again, it can slide. You can go down a little bit on the on the education side and up a little bit on the enforcement side. These are minimums and maximums, uh, but up to 75% may be used for education. And there you see the language uh, from the Virginia Graham Baker Act, which is to educate pool owners, pool operators, other members of the public about the pool and safety, uh, pool and spa safety laws uh, there in your community, uh, and about prevention of drowning and entrapment uh, in swimming pools and spas. And again, we also, um, uh, the law also allows for defraying of some of the administrative costs. Uh, the prevention of drowning, uh, that's where we get the possibility of things like swimming lessons and other things that will um, will uh, help, again, prevent drowning. Um, and other things that we've seen are uh, public information campaigns, um, things of that nature where we're educating the public about both the, um, um, the potential harms as well as uh, that come with swimming, but also the um, VGBA uh, portion of of harms such as um, that relate to the pool pumps and and the mechanics of the pool as well. Okay, I did want to. I've received a number of questions uh, um, about this, and so I do want to address this very specifically. Funds may not be used for pool construction, improvement, renovations, anything like that. We've gotten a number of inquiries um, about local pools and uh, things that are needed to restore them to a working condition. Uh, I'm all for that. Unfortunately, the VGB Act, the VGB Act um, those are not eligible activities. Uh, related to that, um, are paying lifeguards. Uh, that's not something that the grant program will pay for. We will pay for lifeguard training. Again, looking at the education and the drowning prevention goals there. Uh, the one thing that I did also want to note that didn't make it on the slide, uh, but uh, I was looking at some applications and, and saw this, and that's maintenance. So your water test kits, things like that. Uh, that's stuff that you have to do on your on your own generally to keep the pool running. Those are things that would not be uh, eligible under the uh, Pool Safely Grant Program. Okay, here we're going to talk a little bit more about the application. Again, uh, the requested amount uh, can be uh, from fifty thousand up to four hundred thousand. Uh, there is a page link. I really do not expect anyone to uh, need to exceed the eighty pages. I do anticipate that most applications will be well below that, uh, but as part of um, us us posting uh, uh, the FOA and things, we have to put in some page limits. Uh, there is information in the FOA about what counts against the 80 pages, uh, but I really do not anticipate, uh, and, and it's listed there, the application, the budget narratives, the schedule, the staffing plan. Uh, and any other attachments, but I really don't expect uh, applications to exceed 80 pages. Uh, now, just to get your foot in the door, uh, we um, we do need you to 
uh, submit the SF-424. We'll look at this later. That is the standard federal application. It's used for all federal grant, applic uh, grant programs. Uh, it's not something separate you'll need to find. It will be pro provided to you in grants.gov when you're applying. Um, the very, very minimum documents you would uh, you could provide in order to be eligible to um, have an, a complete application would be these 424 sets of documents, and then we would need something on the state law eligibility. Now, I will say that if you only submit those two pieces of information, um, it, it's not likely um, that you'll receive a grant award because there, there's the other attachments detail um, the other things you'll be doing under the grant award. And quite frankly, if we get um, a bunch of applications where we have, you know, a complete application, meaning um, all the attachments and everything, um, and you won't, and someone only submits the 424 and the state law eligibility, uh, I just don't think it will fare well in review. But I did want to note that the 424 and the state law eligibility are the absolute minimum uh, documents that you could submit to be uh, eligible to be considered under the grant program. Okay, here a uh, little bit of uh, standard stuff here. Only one application uh, per applicant organization. Um, so one application from that state, one application from your local community uh, or your uh, your Indian tribe. Um, if there's more than one applicant, we're going to go with the most recent one uh, that was um, uh, validated through grants.gov. I really don't see this as being a problem, but there have been situations I imagine where multiple applications could have been uh, submitted. Okay, uh, there is a registration requirement, which I personally uh, just went through uh, just as a federal employee. I had to get on grants.gov. Uh, you do need to register in grants.gov. It will handle the entire uh, application experience. Um, now, I please pay attention to the uh, red language here. I don't know that it will take a month. I've left this in. This was an existing slide deck, and I did want to leave it in um, just because uh, at this point with an April 30th uh, deadline, um, the registry, and, and you're interested in applying, uh, you may need to pers uh, pursue the registration and then also start developing uh, the grant application concurrently. I don't, some of the, the time there has to deal with validating your organization and validating um, that the person that is working on the organization's behalf is an authorized representative of that organization. So I think that that's part of, part of what may take up to a month. I don't think it's going to take a month of plugging away on grants.gov, but I do think that the process and the time involved in getting all that cleared could take up to a month. So I just wanted to alert you of that possibility. Uh, the grants.gov registration, these are a few uh, key components. Again, these are used uh, uh, throughout the federal government. Uh, the DUNS number, uh, which for many years was required, is no longer required. It has been replaced with the unique entity identifier. Um, and coupled with that, you'll need to uh, register your organization with SAM, System for Award Management. Uh, we do check that if you are not in SAM, um, it's either, it, it will cause a problem down the road. Um, I think most organizations that are, are working with federal grants are already in there, but it is a, um, it is a requirement and it's an ongoing requirement. You have to maintain your, uh, uh, your um, uh, registration there on an annual basis. Uh, and then, as I mentioned here, uh, you're going to have to get your AOR, Authorized Organizational Representative, um, linked up with your organization. And I think that may be part of what, what takes the additional time in grants.gov. And again, here, uh, as, as we have on the slide, we'll, we'll be posting the slide deck as well. Uh, you can look at grants.gov for more information. I do want to emphasize we do not run grants.gov. Grants.gov is run, um, I believe, either as an independent um, group, but um, but it's used pretty much for uh, the clearinghouse for most, not all, but many, many, many uh, federal grant programs. 
Uh, so you will need to work directly with them if you're having any problems with grants.gov. And I've received a couple of inquiries about that, and I just had to refer them uh, back to grants.gov. Okay, I mentioned the 424 or the 424 family. These are standard forms that are associated with uh, about every application. Some require a few others and more, uh, but these are the, uh, the standard ones. Uh, there's an application, SF-424. You have to provide information about your entity there. Uh, there's a separate budget document there, and uh, generally it categorizes the expenses down into, I believe, five categories or six categories. Uh, let's see if I can remember them from the top of my head. It's uh, salary and fringe, supplies, equipment, uh, things like that. Uh, that budget uh portion of the 424, the 424A, will need to match the budget that you are submitting as an attachment. Uh, what we don't want is for the 424A, the standard form to reflect a certain budget number, and then to look at your application and see a separate number uh, there as the uh, attachment. So try and harmonize those numbers uh, uh, between the 424 document and the attachment that we'll talk more about in a minute. Uh, the other ones are, are pretty standard. Uh, I don't expect there to be any issues with them, but uh, they have to do with lobbying. And uh, there's one that's required if you're lobbying. And then um, if you are lobbying, you have to disclose it. Um, I don't anticipate the disclosure will be needed, but again, they're standard forms. Uh, then looking there at the last uh, sub bullet there, other attachments, we'll talk about these in a minute. Uh, I managed to uh, shave one attachment off. So there are really five attachments that we'll be looking at, and two of those uh, would be optional. Um, there are more detailed instructions on this in the FOA. Uh, I did put together the FOA, so I can, I can confirm that. Uh, please look to the FOA for more uh, information on both uh, primarily the attachments, but there is, there is uh, information there on filling out the 424. And as I mentioned, we do not run grants.gov. Uh, this is some information. If you're having uh, some issues, uh, you can reach out directly to them. Um, this is their bread and butter. So uh, I, 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 they'll get back to you, uh, I, I imagine, pretty quickly. But, um, but again, we don't run grants.gov. You'll need to contact them directly if you're having some problems registering there. Okay, and as I mentioned, there are other attachments um, that would um, uh, that would form a uh, more complete application, and we'll look at those in a little bit of detail here. Uh, they're described more fully in the funding opportunity announcement. Um, the real meat of it here is attachment one, which is your project narrative. Um, there, we ask you to uh, just briefly provide a table of contents, uh, depending on how you know, thick your uh, application is, it may be more detailed or less detailed, but we'd like to be able to easily find uh, those portions within your uh, submission. Uh, then there will be a short introduction. We like to know about your community. It helps us um, personalize that application. Let us know um, about the challenges you face as it, as it relates to water safety. I'll talk more about the funding preference here, but in short, uh, we ask that you substantiate um, uh, the funding preference within the introduction. Uh, generally speaking, we will uh, provide an additional five points to your application. If you do the funding, substantiating the funding preference is optional, but if you do um, provide it and we do uh, see that your uh, uh, statistics are higher than the national average, I believe as it relates to uh, drowning, then we would add five points onto your application. If you're kind of in the, you know, 65 point range, that five points would push you over the top. Uh, it is optional, it's up to you, but it does make, uh, it does weight the entire application at 105 points rather than 100 points if you choose to do that. We'll look at that more in a minute. Uh, the work plan, we didn't need to know, you know, what you're doing and there's again, more information in the funding opportunity announcement. The project evaluation plan, we'd like to know that you're looking at what you're doing and if it's not working that you're uh, addressing that or perhaps there, there are other avenues to, um, uh, to program that money. 
Um, then attachment two is a budget table or narrative. We provide a sample, which I strongly encourage you to follow, uh, to use because it does provide, uh, it would provide us an easy way to see this 2575 split between your enforcement uh, activities and your education activities. I did take a look at a couple of the applications prior to us providing this table, and it is very, very difficult uh, for the review committee to uh, sort out uh, the budget if uh, if there's if it's not clearly identified in the table schedule again this is going to need to reflect a two year performance period um, and uh, we'd like to see how you're going to line out your activities there uh, a staffing plan we do want to know if we're paying for positions and or or uh, helping uh, in the salary and fringe area where those positions reside. And uh, again, here we are at attachment five state law eligibility. That's everything we addressed here on the front end. Uh, we do want you to uh, provide documentation there because it is a uh, it is a hard requirement. And then a couple of other uh, as applicable attachments and an indirect cost rate agreement. Your entity may have one of those. If so, we would want to see that so we can verify it uh, and, um, and and use that to um, award uh, award the proper proper amount there. It, not everyone has an indirect cost rate agreement. Generally, we see those at the state level, and then any other relevant documents. And that's that's fairly open. I will say, if there's, um, we do like to see, and I believe it's in the FOA that if there's somebody. Um, uh, filling out the application on behalf of, of 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 somebody that has signing authority that there's a connection there, uh, a letter perhaps that indicates that the person that's filling out the application has the authority uh, to do so um, on behalf of the organization. Uh, that's addressed there in the FOA as well. Okay, uh, the project narrative I mentioned that that was the meat. Again, that's going to have a table of contents, introduction. Funding preference, if applicable, work plan, and the project evaluation plan. Uh, here is just some standard uh, um, um, information on, on how we'd like to see it. Uh, this is reflected in the FOA as well. Um, please font size at 12, 8.5 by 11, pretty standard stuff here. Uh, here, uh, the budget attachment uh, is discussed. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we need the 424 set of, of documents, and the, the 424A is a very basic budget, and um, it's just split into a few different categories. And we would want, again, that to reflect what your attached, more detailed uh, budget narrative or budget date. Uh, 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 detailed budget would show as far as the attachment. Uh, the budget should reflect 100% of federal funds. There is no matching or cost sharing required. Uh, some programs have that, uh, but here it's 100% of federal funds is 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 what's provided. The different budget categories in in some form are re, uh, should be reflected on the attached budget. Um, again, you can look at the uh, attachment that we have there on the FOA and, um, and and see that with the 424A, which is the federal form there. Uh, again, that budget document is found in Appendix A. Here's more information on that funding preference, as I discussed. Uh, if you choose to submit this and uh, your application may uh, will be weighted at 105 points versus 100 points. Um, the ORC, the Objective Review Committee that reviews these applications, uh, will look to that. Again, please highlight that in the introduction, separate it out so that we can clearly see that should you elect to uh, document that. And again, it's data demonstrating that the number of incidents involving child drownings, non fatal submersions, and drain entrapments in the ju jurisdiction relative to the applicable population significantly exceeds comparable national statistics. Uh, we do have a link there on uh, 
where you can find some of this information. Um, but again, we look for that in the introduction. And as, as is pointed out here, if you receive a score of 70 or above, you'll receive the five point adjustment um, on that score. Here's a little bit on the process. Uh, we will initially review um, both an applicant type. Are you a uh, state, federal, or um, tribal organization? Excuse me, state, local, or tribal organization? And then separately, we would look to the attachments uh, involving uh, legal eligibility. Are your laws compliant with the VGB Act? Uh, the the ORC will then meet. We will we will look uh, at the various applications we received, uh, those that are eligible, and uh, those will receive um, a score. And then based on that ORC, uh, the document uh, which um, uh, memorializes that you are receiving a federal award is the notice of award. This is a little bit on the scoring. Uh, I did redo the weighting of the sections for uh, this FOA in part because the work plan is, is such a uh, uh, project narrative uh, and the work plan uh, are so meaty that we, I, I did want to uh, assess them a little bit higher than they had previously. So the introduction 10 to 15 points, that 15 points being uh, if, if you um, uh, apply for the funding preference, uh, the work plan and, or the work plan there being 50 points, resources and capabilities, 25 points, and then the project evaluation plan at 15 points. And there's more information in that. It's discussed in, in detail in the funding opportunity announcement. Okay, and if successful, you will receive a notice of award. And that is the uh, document uh, indicating that you've received uh, the grant award. It includes a number of things, uh, the terms of award, the conditions, um, there'll be an approved budget amount, the amount of federal funds, and a description of the, the, the project. Um, there's no easy way to accept the award. So if, if you are notified that, um, uh, that you'll be receiving a notice of award, we do need to see, uh, receive an email back from your authorized representative indicating that you're accepting it. We don't want this languishing out there if, if the funds can be uh, put to use um, with another recipient uh, should your organization elect not to uh, take on the grant award. Uh, here's more, again, grants.gov is where the uh, application will need to be submitted. Uh, you can search CPSC and we'll pop up. Um, I think I used the term pool and uh, it popped up right up right at the top there. The pool safely grant program has its own website. The, um, the FOA is posted there uh, as long as the FAQs and a number of other um, uh, helpful things. Uh, I do encourage you to, uh, in addition to uh, us answering your questions, you can look at the FAQs and they they go into a lot of detail, especially on this legal eligibility and uh, other items. Um, so please take a look at those FAQs. Here we have the grants.gov contact center um, that you can contact them for uh, additional information if you're having trouble. My name, Harvey Kincaid, hkincaid at cpsc.gov. Uh, you may reach me by email. Um, that would be preferred. And Janet Davis, who, who I work alongside, jdavis at denali.gov. Uh, she's our interagency partner and uh, is, is assisting with the Pull Safely Grant Program. Uh, you can contact either of us and, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to um, provide you an answer if you have a question. And um, thank you for your interest. See that all right? Yeah. I do know it looks like we received a few questions and we will try and leave the balance here to discuss those. list of them. Okay. Doesn't want to expand expand for you. Oh, thank you. 
Oh, try yeah, try that guy. You might be able to expand it. Okay, there we go. There we go. Sorry, our chat box opened up and it was about one inch by two inch. It was quite small. Okay, sure. The first question here uh, from Danielle Staple. Can you clarify if the budget amount listed is per year or over the two year period? It's over the two year period. So the $400,000 would apply as the max of the 50,000 on the low end uh, would apply to that two year period. Um, so that's a total amount. Um, it looks like we got another question from Danielle Stable here. If the requirement language is in the code that is enforceable, but not necessarily, not necessarily a law, is that acceptable? Uh, I do think it needs to be a law in order to be enforceable. So we would uh, be asking there that you document the, the, you know, the actual reference for the law, um, but it does need to be a law. Uh, otherwise, it's not enforceable, I'd say. So, uh, yes, it does need to be a law. Would it, um, Megan Morell, uh, would it be possible to get a copy of this PowerPoint? Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to reduce it to a PDF and try and get it up on the, the website fairly quick. I'm not sure how quick, uh, but yes, we'll we'll go ahead and put it up there. See the question. Yeah, we'll send okay. the deck out. Yes, we will send the deck out. Uh, let's see, Danielle Staple, if you want to put more than 25% into enforcement activities, is that acceptable? Absolutely. The 25% is really the minimum requirement in the law, um, so that can slide up. Um, the 75% being the education, that can't slide up. That can only slide down. Um, so anything less than 75%, 75% or lower would be acceptable on the education side. But yes, you may put more than 25% into uh, enforcement activities. Okay, we have a question from, uh, I'm not sure from, who from. You stated that the grant program may not be used for pool construction slash renovation. Can it be used for design and development of pools, training designers? Can it be used for customer service organizations assisting pool users? Uh, I do not believe so. That does not appear to be uh, uh, allowable activities under the grant program. I think they're too tight, too closely tied to construction and renovation. Uh, I'm not sure about the customer or service organizations assisting pool users, but yeah, generally no. And it looks. Can the grant program be used to train compliance personnel supporting uh, companies designing, designing and delivering pools? I do not think so. The, again, we're looking at uh, applicants being a state, uh, uh, state local uh, government or a tribal or, tri or an Indian tribe. Well, if they're compliant, if they're regulatory compliance personnel, can they support private companies? If they are state? If they are state, then yes. I saw the private companies. I was thinking private employees. Um, um, but I think, I think more generally, if they are, are, are um, governmental personnel that are supporting private, I will say we, you know, part of the program again is education. We've had uh, recipients, um, you know, go to private companies that 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 work on pools, that do pool related stuff, uh, in order to educate and and help push out the the uh, VGBA compliance. Um, so potentially, but I'm not. There's not enough there for me to say definitively, or for us to say definitively. The anticipated award date. Um, we are hoping, and I believe this is in the here, copy of it here. Uh, the anticipated award date. I think we put in a, put in a June date. Yeah, anticipated award June fifteenth of two thousand twenty three. That's anticipated. We'll we'll see what happens. Um, but we we are trying to because of the seasonal nature of this grant program. We're trying to um, uh, respect that and. 
and get it out in time for people to hopefully program the, the money uh, over this upcoming pool season. We got more? Yeah, this one here. Oh, I'm sorry. Jonathan, do the funds cover the cost of pool attendance activities, coordinators who lead or coordinate the swimming lessons? I would, th it could, yes, because uh, we are talking about the, you know, having had young kids that went through swimming lessons, there are a number of people in the pool. Um, but yes, if it, I, I would think so if it leads to, um, um, you know, efficacy of the swimming lessons themselves. Let's see, looking through here. Uh, do you have to use the entire two year period or can you use the funds in a shorter time period with the Uh, we would want your budget. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me read the question. Do you have to use the entire 2 year period or can you use the funds in a shorter time period? With the 2 year grant period, uh, as the FOA indicates, we would expect to see a, a budget and a, uh. Schedule and a project that reflects the 2 year period. Another question about the PowerPoint, providing the PowerPoint. Uh, looking for my attachments. We got a question here. Uh, can you provide some examples of fundable projects? I did uh, put together a couple of things, a couple of different things that we've seen um, on the enforcement side. Uh, salaries and fringe. Uh, we've seen mileage because of the nature of of the code enforcement, um, certified CPO certified pool operator training. Um, let's see, uh, development of enforcement e training. Uh, I know we have one recipient that's doing something a little bit more uh, online as far as a training uh, so that it can be provided to a lot of different people. Um, law and safety code enforcement trainer trainings. Um, uh, we do have one recipient that's doing um, some audits of, of uh, permits and uh, some pool construction data to, to help um, develop a, a database related to enforcement. Um, uh, technical support for uh, ongoing enforcement um, efforts. And then on the education side, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, educational campaigns, uh, that's been uh, pretty standard. We've seen that in a few different places. Uh, drowning uh, prevention education events, lifeguard uh, training that I mentioned, uh, swimming lessons, uh, community education on pool safety, and um, salary and fringe there as well, depending on the nature of the of the uh, personnel performing those educational duties. Let's see where are we at here. There we are. Are there limits to the type of sump contractor that can provide swim lessons? For instance, public nonprofit swimming facility versus private for profit swimming facilities, i.e., a swim school. Um, I don't think there are uh, the subcontract is is a pretty open type of instrument, but I would highlight the uh, language that was con uh, included in the pr congressional notes that I highlighted on the front end uh, related to getting involved with civic organizations. That's uh, kind of uh, a little bit more of an emphasis from Congress. Oh, there we are. Uh, can funds be used for building safety fences for existing pools? I don't think so. Um, really, when we're talking about enforcement, we're talking about enforcing existing laws related to safety fences um, or barriers uh, related to pools. Um, that just seems to be a little bit too much like uh, construction, yeah. pool construction. Yeah, uh, th that's uh, Barbara Little, who's uh, 
with our Office of General Counsel, and she and I have been working together along with Jonathan here. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit too close to construction, I believe. Here's one from Heather. Can a portion of the award be allocated to drowning prevention focused nonprofits for focus for eligible activities? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, nonprofits being civic organizations, uh, you'll need to follow some of your local laws related to contracting and how you work with those folks. Uh, but as I mentioned, that's clear, clearly part of what uh, the congressional intent is here. Okay. That is the bottom of the uh, the chat window. Oh, oh wait, there's a new one. Could funds be used to defray code enforcement violation fees? So entities can put that money into repairs of fences. I don't think so. Um, the, the word defray as it appears in the law really relates to the administrative expenses that the that the uh, legal entity is encountering and in, in trying to do this. Um, but I don't, I, that does not appear to be allowable. And I, I go back to what we said previously that it would be a little bit um, too close to construction or even maintenance here as far as uh, keeping the barriers uh, intact. Okay, seeing no other no other questions. No, nope. we have eight minutes left, but uh, that's always good to finish. So early. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> Any other questions? There's one. Oh, there we go. Uh, the question is, how about specific funds designated for drowning prevention signage around public bodies of water? I think. Think so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking around because we have had the discussion here. Most of the, a lot of this, especially in the enforcement has to do with, uh, with pools and some of the mechanics there. But, uh, as we all know, um, any body of water presents a presents a, uh, uh, potential drowning situation. So, yeah, I think that that would be allowable. Um, that would be categorized as under the educational, uh, basket of funds. Yeah, that would be on the education side. So you'd you're gonna have to balance that out with others, uh, other stuff on the enforcement side. Uh, question from Alyssa. So that would apply to life jacket loaner situations as well. Loaner stations. Loaner stations. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. You loan out life jackets to people at a beach say, for instance. Right, but what what would the funds be going to? The life jackets themselves, the paying the, for the station, yeah, paying for the station. Um, Alyssa, if you could uh, send something more detailed about what you're asking about, uh, either to myself or to Janet. Uh, again, I am H K I N C A I D H Kincaid at CPSC dot G O V. Um, that might be taking some of that a little bit farther, but I'm kind of curious as to what you got in mind. So, uh, um, so we'll uh, we'll try and address that one offline. Yes, yeah. To Heather, thank you. Uh, we are surrounded here in Louisiana by water. Yes, as a prior resident of Louisiana, I can confirm that you are like, especially down in southern Louisiana, you are likely surrounded by water. Um, Okay, with that, I'd say that if you uh, continue to have a question or if there's something that you wanted uh, to address, um, please email myself. Uh, Jonathan has his uh, provided his information. Uh, Janet Davis, uh, J Davis at Denali, D E N A L I dot gov. Uh, go ahead and send us an email uh, and we will try and get back to you that way. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for your interest. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, your applications and um, and uh, thanks. Very good. I'm going to stop our recording and thank you all for joining us.